Good evening and welcome. Tonight we're going to be reading through some articles from History Magazine. Also, do you like the nails today? They're extra long. The nails that I order, sometimes they have like a, they'll throw one in for free and they threw in a free one that's a, a length that I don't normally get. It's so long for me, so I figured it'd be good for tapping. So, tonight's articles were picked by my channel member, Callum. Thanks so much, Callum, for your wonderful choices. And if you would like to pick the History Magazine articles that I read, the membership button is just down there. You click the big join button. Memberships are only 99 cents a month, as cheap as I can make them. There's no tiers or anything, and you get lots of extra bonus videos and little perks and behind the scenes things. So I thank all my channel members at the start of all my videos now. You guys are so wonderful. And um, this is probably my favorite perk you guys get is picking the articles. So I can thank you to Callum. I'm going to pick the very first mini article though. In the United States, it is February and February is Black History Month where we celebrate the accomplishments of Black Americans past and present. So I really want to read you this article about Harriet Powers. Really incredible person. Threads of history. The quilts of Harriet Powers. And as I read about her quilts, don't worry, there won't be pictures coming up because you'll want to see them after I describe them. They're so, so neat. The quilts of Harriet Powers. In the photograph speckled with age, the gaze of the woman is direct. The hands, strong with long tapered fingers, hold a scrap of fabric. She wears an apron. A closer look reveals it is more than a modest domestic icon. It is an artistic statement. The material is common, cheap cotton embellished by an uncommon exuberance of scalloped edges and large appliqued sunbursts. The sunbursts echo those on two late 19th century quilts, made also by the wearer of that apron, Harriet Powers, an African-American woman from Athens, Georgia. Born enslaved, Powers would transcend that to express her powerful creative vision in stitched squares of fabric. Her vision appears in a quilt, known as the Pictorial Quilt, in the collection of the Museum of Fine Arts Boston, or the MFA. Her other surviving masterwork, known as the Bible Quilt, can be found in the Smithsonian National Museum of American History. Both were made in the late 19th century. Quilt making did not originate in the United States, but it has a strong American connection. These blankets were both practical and artistic, often deeply personal and reflective of the artists themselves. The entry for Powers' pictorial quilt in the archives of the MFA is as straightforward as its maker's gaze. Applique quilt, dyed and printed cotton fabric supplied to cotton. The quilt is divided into 15 pictorial rectangles, worked with pieces of beige, pink, mauve, orange, dark red, gray-green, and shades of blue cotton. What the notes don't say, only the quilt itself can, is that it and its sibling, the Bible quilt, are the personal testimony of a woman of unshakable faith and self-confidence. Novelist Alice Walker, writing of the Bible quilt, called it a quilt unlike any other in the world, the work of an artist who left her mark the only material she could afford. Folklorist Gladys Marie Fry would sit in front of that quilt in reverie. Who was Harriet, she wondered. What was her history? Stories of Starfall Powers' history, not unlike her quilt, is pieced together, gathered from the scraps biographers used to assemble a life. Letters, museum files, Faded photographs, interviews, scholarly journals, exhibition catalogs, and newspaper clips. 
What is known is that Powers was born into slavery in 1839 in Madison County, Georgia. Married in 1885, she later moved with her husband, Armstead, after emancipation, to a farm closer to Athens. She was deeply religious, literate, and gifted. Make sure it's totally in frame. There we go. The Bible quilt has 11 pictorial squares. They depict, among other stories, Adam and Eve, Jacob's Ladder, and The Last Supper. The panels in this and the MFA quilt are presented in the order in which she wants to tell those stories. It's a cycle, like a renaissance fresco, says Jennifer Swope, curator of the MFA's textiles and fashion arts department. Moving and deceptive in simplicity. Handed down along with the quilts was a description of each panel by Powers herself. She was the storyteller and would make sure her intentions were understood. We see trauma, trouble, suffering, chaos that reflects stories of her own life and those of African Americans, says Tia Miles, a professor of history at Harvard University. In the pictorial quilt, viewers can count down to the second row of the panels, move three squares over to the right, and find the dynamic center panel. Orange comet-like forms topped by starburst shapes arc toward Earth as four human figures, a family, lift their arms, perhaps in surprise, fear, or both. A rabbit sits in the left bottom corner. A cat leans into the right bottom corner. An eerily disembodied hand floats at the top left. Let me show you the picture of it first before we read on. This is the pictorial quilt. And this is the square they're talking about. The falling stars, the family, a bunny, a cat. Then we're going to talk about this hand up here. Isn't this lovely? It says... The square, Powers wrote, shows the falling of the stars on November 13th, 1833. The people were fright and thought that the end had come. God's hand stayed the stars. The varmints rushed out of their beds. And this is the Bible quilt up here, at least a part of it. I'll read more about it. It was an actual event. The Leonid Meteor Shower of 1833. Shooting stars fell like rain. People were terrified and many thought it was Judgment Day, Miles explains. They theorized that God was bringing the world to its close, and some enslavers actually worried perhaps it was sin of holding people as property that was leading to this judgment moment. There's like a historical depiction of it down here. The meteor shower happened before Powers was born, but she had heard the stories. The quilt was her own telling of the event. Trauma, trouble, chaos, and finally, salvation embodied by the hand of God. On display, the pictorial quilt exhibited at an exposition in Nashville in 1897 was bought by a group of faculty ladies at Atlanta University as a gift the Reverend Charles Cuthbert Hall, possibly to celebrate his appointment as president of Union Theological Seminary. The Bible quilt was displayed in 1886 at a fair in Athens, Georgia, where Jenny Smith, a white art teacher at a girls' school, tried to buy it. It was not for sale. Several years later, when the Powers family was stressed financially, it was. Forced to sell the darling offspring of her brain, Powers delivered the purchase in Knox Cart. She described holding the precious burden in her lap, encased in a clean flower sack, which was still further enveloped in a crocus sack. She returned several times to visit the quilt, Smith wrote. She was only in a measure consoled for its loss when I promised to save her all my scraps. Both quilts would end up in museum collections, and that part of the story, the journey from her black hands to private ownership in white hands to museum wall, is complicated by what Miles suggests is the difficult dynamics of race in museum collecting, philanthropy, and stewardship. 
It is not through Powers' intentional will that her quilts wound up on display in two of the country's most renowned museums, Miles has written. On the other hand, it is through that journey those quilts have been preserved, appreciated, and recognized for their significance. Had she known her quilts would be hanging on a museum wall, she would have praised the Lord, says quilter and independent scholar Kyra Hicks. Powers was proud of her work. When she was alive, she did not hide her art in a trunk or under a spread, Laurel Thatcher Ulrich, a Harvard University emerita professor of history, writes. When others admired her quilts, she insisted on explaining their meaning. Her quilts survived not only because they are remarkable works of art, but because she spoke about them to anyone who would listen. Her voice can be heard not only through her quilts, but also directly in a letter Hicks discovered in the files of the Lee County Historical Society in Keokuk, Iowa. Powers was 58, and in that letter she spoke of her church, her husband, her nine children, learning to read, and of her quilts, including three whose whereabouts remain unknown. It is tempting to hope that the quilts she mentions, one with 2,500 diamonds, are hidden in a trunk waiting to be discovered, but one can feel gratitude for the two that do survive. And, at six, aren't we lucky that there are loving hands to pass it along? There's gratitude as well for the portrait of her gazing across decades. Powers visited a photographer's studio in Athens for that picture, a deliberate, confident act of self-documentation. She stands alone, on her own, fabric in her fingers, wrapped in her art. This I accomplish, she says in that letter. Harriet Powers knew her worth. Isn't that so cool? But let's get on to the main event of the video. Callum thought we'd have a very cool naval theme in a way. So we're going to start off reading about the naval power of Greece, triremes. And here's a really cool depiction of one. We'll read all about them. Here we go. The fast, maneuverable, and dangerous, the trireme was the most feared ship in ancient Greece. With powerful bronze rams and the ability to turn on a dime, it would leave enemy ships dead in the water by punching holes in their sides or smashing their oars. In his histories, Herodotus writes how Greek naval dominance owed so much to the brilliant use of triremes in battle. In the 5th century BCE, Athenian shipyards had the capacity for over 300 triremes, the most famous warships of antiquity. The trireme, a term derived from the Greek triris, three rows of oars, was the result of, a, of the continuous development of naval technology in the Greek world. The epic poem Iliad, attributed to Homer and written in the 8th century BCE, mentions ships called triaconters and pentaconters, vessels that were crewed by 30 or 50 men, respectively. Biremes, with two rows of oarsmen, are recorded on 8th century BCE reliefs. At the beginning of the 7th century BCE, accumulated experience led to new technical advances, and the much more sophisticated trireme model appeared. Uh, Thucydides wrote that the Corinthians are the first to introduce the design to the Greek world, though modern historians think triremes may have first been built in Phoenicia, in the eastern Mediterranean, and what is now Lebanon. The Greeks considered triremes to be living things, each endowed with a sacred character. For this reason, the ships were given individual names, which were almost always feminine, their characteristic eyes, located on both sides of the prow, were used to find their way through the sea. The walkways protruding from the prow were their ears, and the sails were their wings. It's a picture of one of the eyes right here. Captain and Crew Faster and more stable than their predecessors, triremes were expensive to produce. 
manufacturing costs ran as high as more than one talent, or 6,000 drachmas, or 58 pounds of silver. If a ship were damaged in battle, it could still be put to good use. With proper maintenance, triremes could remain in service for 20 to 25 years before being decommissioned or sold as war surplus. History has recorded some that were sailing for more than 80 years. The ships in the best shape were reserved for the military, while older ones were used mainly for surveillance and transportation. Athens had two prized triremes, the Salamina and the Paralo. Noted for their beauty, these flagships were often used for diplomatic missions or rituals, such as transporting Athenian athletes to the Olympic Games every four years. The Athenian fleet boasted more than 50,000 oarsmen, few of whom were slaves or foreigners. Most of them belonged to the class of Thetes, citizens of the wage, or of the wage earning class, who could not cover the cost of arming themselves, as soldiers were required to do. The development of the navy as a bulwark of Athenian democracy in the 5th century BCE raised this social class's influence in relation to the aristocracy. It is no coincidence that Greek philosophers like Plato and Euenus and Athenian citizens began to refer to their leaders as helmsmen who guided the ship of state. Paying the crew was a considerable expense. Wages were about one talent per month, an expense paid by the captain or the triarchus from his own pocket. Keeping the crew well-fed was crucial to their performance. A typical diet included salted fish, oat cakes, wine, cheese, vegetables, and about seven quarts of water per day. The fleet's, sorry, the fleet's departure, commanded by one or more naval commander, or the strategoi, was an important event. Their training enabled the crew to get in position and check that the ship, their tools, and weapons were in good working order quickly, within just 30 seconds according to a modern simulation. A priest officiated at an animal sacrifice before the captain offered a prayer and hymn to the gods. Finally, a cup of wine was poured over the ship's bow and stern as a libation. Under sail, the oarsmen followed the orders of the calustes, calustes, issued by shouting or striking a piece of timber with a mace. When the roar of waves or battle prevented the rowing master from being heard, an allos, a wind instrument like a double flute, marked the rowing beat. The oarsmen joined in with traditional chants to keep in time. Triremes did not have much room to board on board for storage or sleeping, so the boats tended to sail only during the day. At night, the trireme was hauled out of the water, both to protect its hull from shipworms, shipworms and to allow the crew to eat and rest, while ashore the hull could also be checked for needed repairs. Ramming speeds. The trireme's most feared weapon was a bronze battering ram attached to the prow of the ship. Fierce ancient naval battles were fought by trying to slam into the side of an enemy ship and either puncture the hull or damage the oars to immobilize it. Scholars estimate the maximum ramming speed to be around 9 knots, or 10.4 miles an hour. A typical strategy was to ram an enemy ship and retreat quickly to let it sink. In the case of surrender, or when the attackers picked up the survivors before they drowned, captured oarsmen were allowed to change sides. Experienced oarsmen were very valuable assets. If an attacking ship rammed a ship and became stuck in its side, each crew would be forced into combat with the goal of seizing the intact ship, while the vessel that had been rammed would be abandoned. Dozens of triremes would return to Athens in early winter. If dolphins swam off their bows, it was a good omen, 
as these animals are believed to save sailors from drowning. Each trireme underwent repairs and cleaning in port. The trier arcs presented reports, their missions, while sailors and oarsmen collected their wages. They are in battle. Reinvention and Resurgence Greece's naval dominance did not last forever, and the trireme evolved. Modifications to the trireme as a design were spearheaded by various Mediterranean powers and put to the test in the period when the successors of Alexander the Great fought for dominance in the late 4th and early 3rd centuries BCE. By the time of the First Punic War in the mid-3rd century BCE, Romans and Carthaginians were fighting at sea using quadriremes and quinquiremes. Wow. When the Romans conquered Macedonia in 168 BCE, they were surprised to discover an ancient trireme left abandoned in a shipyard for 70 years. They considered it a relic but so beautifully made that they reused it. History's final recorded battle relying on the descendants of the trireme was the Battle of Lepanto off western Greece on October 7th, 1571, more than 2,000 years after triremes first sailed. The Holy League coalition of Spain and many Italian city-states smashed the Ottoman fleet, killing nearly half their 67 thousand men. The Battle of Lepanto was one of the last naval conflicts in the West to rely heavily on human-driven galleys. The subsequent naval conflicts would be dominated by sail-powered craft. The vast deployment of craft that marked naval battles in antiquity was also becoming a thing of the past. Nearly 700 galleys took part in the Battle of Echnomus between Rome and Carthage in 256 BCE. A total of around 70 vessels took part in the Battle of Trafalgar of 1805. Today, archaeologists are keen to find any material remains of 5th century BCE triremes throughout the Mediterranean world. Because the ships were made of soft wood and susceptible to shipworms and decay, what are shipworms? Shipworms and decay, well preserved wrecks are difficult, if not impossible, to find in the warm sea waters. The bronze rams, however, would survive centuries at the bottom of the sea, and archaeologists continue to comb the waters for them. One of the first and most significant discoveries was the so-called Athlete Ram, discovered in 1980 near the village of Athlete, Israel, giving great insight into how these weapons were forged. The heavy bronze ram weighs more than 1,000 pounds. It was found with timbers still attached from what is now believed to be a trireme or quadrireme, from around the 2nd century BCE. One of the most valuable archaeological sites is the military port of Piraeus. Located about 5 miles from Athens, Piraeus was home to the mighty Athenian fleet at the height of its powers in the 5th century BCE. Archaeologists were thrilled to find the remains of several ancient boathouses or Neosoikoi, which helped them better understand not only how triremes were built, but also how they were maintained. The hunt continues for these former boats that ruled the Mediterranean, and what they can reveal about the shipbuilding culture of ancient Athens. Are there any more pictures? No. Bummer. But let's move on to our last story for tonight. It's in this magazine. Life on a galleon. Let's find the article first. Let me see, let me see. Nope. <laughs> Almost. So it's a long magazine. <laughs> there we go. All aboard the Spanish galleons. And look at them go. Pretty, pretty cool. Fit the whole 
article. I just have to move it around, but that's okay. For the people of 16th century Spain, the world was expanding right before their eyes. After 1492, Spanish voyages of discovery revealed the Americas and the Pacific, while new eastern routes were rounding Africa to reach Asia. To defend and expand Spain's new empire, galleons sailed on a growing network of sea routes and brought colonists to these lands. The crossings were grueling and long, Testing the resolve of every passenger. I have an idea. There we go. <laughs> In fall 1492, Christopher Columbus was the first European to sight the Bahamas and Cuba. On December 6th, apparently believing he had landed in Sipango, which is Japan, he claimed for Spain the island he dubbed La Isla Española which is the location of modern Haiti and the Dominican Republic. More voyages followed, and Spain's geographic knowledge of the Americas expanded rapidly. The islands of the Caribbean became a logical staging post for Spain's transatlantic ambitions. Setting out from his base in Cuba in 1519, Hernán Cortés completed the conquest of the Valley of Mexico in 1521. Footholds gained in North and South America led to more gains. Francisco Pizarro pushed farther west into South America to topple the Inca Empire in 1533. Spain began seeking faster ways to reach Asian markets from Central America. In 1564, a system of two annual trade fleets was consolidated. The New Spain fleet would sail from the Spanish port of Seville for New Spain, docking in Veracruz, in modern-day Mexico. In Mexico, they say Veracruz. The galleons of the Tierra Firme fleet would depart for Cartagena de, de Indias, which is today in Colombia. An extension of the New Spain fleet was established in the Pacific port of Acapulco in Mexico. From there, the Manila Galleon sailed for the Philippines to facilitate trade with China and other Asian markets. Passage to the Americas The huge expansion into the American possessions was fueled in part by Spanish immigration. Clergymen were sent by the Catholic Church not only to evangelize, but also to project Spain's political supremacy. The state needed soldiers, administrators, merchants, farmers, and laborers. Many Spaniards saw a passage on the galleons as an opportunity to gain wealth and prestige in the growing empire. Securing legal passage on a transatlantic galleon, however, meant a lengthy bureaucratic process. The first step was to obtain a license from the House of Commerce, the Café de la Contratación in Seville, a southern Spanish city that controlled maritime trade with America. Spain's discriminatory laws against people of Jewish and Muslim descent were extended to prevent them from traveling to the Americas. Anyone wanting to go had to prove that they were a Cristiano Viejo, or Old Christian. Once the legal hurdles had been cleared, immigrants had to purchase a ticket from a ship owner and have it publicly notarized. In the 16th century, the average price of a ticket was around 7,500 maravedis, which is equivalent to approximately 3,250 US dollars today. Although the amount would vary depending on the final destination and the type of room and board. Would-be migrants would need more funds than that if they were to have a chance of success in their new life. First, there were the costs of the initial stay in Seville prior to sailing, a period that could be prolonged if fleets were delayed, as often happened. Then they needed to support themselves during the first weeks in the colonies as they looked for work. And these pages just won't turn off.
expenses could easily quadruple to the equivalent of 15,000 US dollars or more. Travelers raised funds in different ways. Some sold their Spanish properties or used their wives' as dowries. Others asked family for cash in exchange for renouncing a future inheritance. Some left their families indebted for years to come, with only the promise of future riches to sustain them. The total number of Spaniards who crossed the Atlantic in the 16th and 17th centuries is disputed among historians, but estimates rise as high as 450,000 people. The profile evolved over time. During the earliest phase of Spain's expansion in the Americas, between 1492 and 1519, men outnumbered women, who accounted for slightly more than 5% of passenger lists. The percentage rises progressively over the following two centuries to as high as 25 to 30 percent in the 17th century. Hard Passage For the thousands of Spaniards who'd made this journey across the Atlantic, life on board a galleon for a smaller, even more cramped carrick was, or a smaller, even more cramped carrick was difficult. In 1539, the bishop royal advisor and author Antonio de Guevara wrote in El Arte de Mariar, or the Arts of Navigation, that all common hardships experienced on land, such as hunger, thirst, heat, and sickness, were twice as bad at sea. Threats of corsair attacks added to the danger. Terrible storms loomed, but if the seas weren't raging, passengers had to endure being becalmed for long periods. Sharing the ship with live animals, such as chickens, pigs, sheep, and mules, and the vermin that accompanied them further degraded the situation on board. It's a little friend right there. Not even the wealthy could insulate themselves from the dreary conditions. High-ranking officials and their families could pay for private chambers in the stern, obtaining a certain degree of privacy but most of the journey's discomforts were universal. Sewage arrangements were basic, with passengers sometimes having to climb overboard and cling tightly to the side of the ship as they relieved themselves in full view. Wow. Only later were transatlantic ships fitted with latrines in the stern or bow. I can't imagine. <laughs> to distract themselves from the hardships and monotony of the crossing, Onboard entertainments were advised. There would be singing under the stars, ballads accompanied by trumpet, flute, guitar, or shaum, which is an oboe-like instrument. There were certain to be a shaum on board every ship, as they were used not only to transmit orders, but also to play battle anthems. Although most passengers were not literate, those who were might entertain the others by reading aloud from books. Cockfights and games of chance also helped pass the long hours. As these diversions kept the long-suffering crew entertained, ship officials usually turned a blind eye to gambling, even though it was officially prohibited. Sometimes the captains even joined in. Other passengers opted for quieter pursuits, such as fishing over the side of the ship, a pastime that might yield the reward of an extra meal from time to time. Oof. That's pretty rough. My goodness. I think it's the nails. <laughs> Let's see. During the months long Atlantic crossing was no picnic either. Nutrient rich fruits and vegetables were often consumed within the first few days of the trip before spoiling. Much of the non-perishable food was lacking in rich nutrition and flavor. The primary food were hard cakes made with wheat flour and no yeast. They were baked twice to make them durable, but this process made them very dry and almost too hard to chew. Every month, each passenger was allowed about six pints of vinegar and two pints of civilian olive oil. 
meat, typically pork, was usually served at least twice a week, and on the remaining days, the passengers and crew consumed beans, rice, and fish. Sometimes the pork was fresh if a pig had been recently slaughtered on board, but more often it was sachina, pork preserved by salting and drying. Cheese was another essential component in the galleon diet. Hard cheese traveled well without spoiling and was a calorie-rich meal for passengers. Occasionally, nuts and dried fruit such as almonds, chestnuts, and raisins are included. To drink, passengers received daily rations of four liters of water and one liter of wine, but the water ration could be drastically reduced if the ship was becalmed for long periods of time. Water shortages struck the most fear into the hearts of passengers. Even under normal conditions, the water could be contaminated. Accounts from several voyages described it turning green. Oof. Disease and death. The poor diet on the ship could have deadly consequences for passengers. A lack of fresh fruits and vegetables often caused scurvy, a deadly disease caused by a deficiency in vitamin C. Symptoms including fatigue, bruised limbs, aching joints, and bleeding gums would set in any time after one to two months, once the body's stores of the vitamin were depleted. During the Age of Exploration, historians estimate that scurvy was the leading cause of death at sea, surpassing deaths due to enemy attacks, storms, shipwrecks, and other illnesses. Although all ships were required to carry medicines and a surgeon or barber on board, if passengers fell seriously ill, there is very little that could be done. The chances were high that they would die before reaching their destination, and if death did come, there was no choice but to throw the body overboard. The body was first wrapped in coarse cloth and then weighted down with stones or small cannonballs so that it would sink. The clergyman, who was always on board, conducted a funeral service. Passengers embarked on these voyages with high expectations of a better life but the soaring mortality rates on these voyages, which barely dropped until the mid-19th century, are a reminder that the dangers of transatlantic travel in the 16th and 17th centuries were higher still. Speaking of cannonballs, my upstairs neighbor was just throwing some around. I apologize for that. But that's going to be it for tonight. Thank you so much for watching. I do hope that you found this video relaxing and educational, and I hope that you have a very good, 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 good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.